Practically everything that happened in the great Edwardian houses was about displaying the wealth and enhancing the social status of their owners. And that includes the fruit and vegetable gardens of the day. Because if you could put asparagus on the table for Christmas and figs for Easter, then your business and social rivals knew they had to take you pretty seriously. The Grand Edwardian Estates had a serious habit of lavish entertaining to support, and a ready supply of top-notch homegrown produce underpinned the whole extravagant enterprise. So, taking a leaf or two from the kitchen gardens of the time, I'm going to see just how creative I can be with fruit and vegetables. The kitchen garden at West Dean Estate in Sussex had to put food on the table 12 months of the year, and since King Edward himself was a regular visitor, it had to be quite literally fit for a king. These days, head gardener Jim Buckland isn't under quite so much pressure to impress, but he's still keeping the Edwardian traditions of excellence alive, particularly in the spectacular walled fruit garden. You can train a fruit tree into any shape. I mean, if you're feeling completely fanciful, you could write your name in it, which has been done. <laughs> Well, this one's known as a goblet for fairly obvious reasons. You've got this kind of open vase shape. And then behind us, we've got a forward pyramid, not complete, but on its way. Is it done purely for decorative reasons, or is there a practical or productive element to training these trees? A combination of the two, really. They are highly productive in a relatively small space. Very good light distribution, good air movement through the tree. But probably one of the most important things is ease of picking. So it's aesthetic, it's, it's practical and efficient as a way of cropping. Yeah. Is it also at some level quite symbolic of man's desire and increasing ability to control nature? Yeah, well, I think it is, yeah. I mean, it's a very visual demonstration of that. I mean, the whole thing about the wall garden was about the manipulation of nature, about manipulating the environment, the climate. And each wall had particular fruits associated with it. So the aspect of the wall dictated that. And physically, how is it achieved? This is a youngster, a mere snipper. You plant your one-year-old maiden, as it's known, a one-year-old tree with a single stem, and then you do a very cruel thing. You lop the top of it off, and by doing that, hopefully, you stimulate some of the buds below that cut, and you train those out, and then start to train them up. Ah, get that okay. one established first, get it really well up, and then take the next tier out. So you may have to wait two seasons before you start forming the next so you, tier. So this will grow back to, to so then you, shoot off a second tier of... And you just keep repeating that process until you get to the top. And there's supposed to be seven tiers. So in theory, you're looking at about six, seven, eight years to, to do the job. And once these are started, you're going to basically shape them every step of the way. They're just going to be tied up, tied up, tied up. So they're not going to have a chance to go anywhere other than where you're you want them to go. They're not going anywhere I don't want them to go, no. <laughs> you have to be tough. You've got to be, t you've got to be a discipline. real discipline. You've got to be the sergeant major of the fruit garden, yeah. Well, here we've a tree which is fairly well established, but yeah, for a variety of reasons, I'm a bit behind with the pruning view, so would oh, you like okay. to give me a hand? Yes, please. Right, so all of this stuff can come off. OK, I'm all right with that one. Yeah, you're OK there, yeah. With that one. Keep going, yeah. I'm yeah. swift, I'll say that for you. <laughs> I'm not worrying you with any of this, am I? <laughs> not too much. Traditionally, the head gardener had to hand over his lovingly cultivated produce to the chef of the house. Luckily, in my Edwardian playhouse, that's me. The idea of transforming nature with human will and human skill was carried through enthusiastically from the garden to the kitchen, where many of the fruits that were grown with such painstaking care were changed into elaborate, almost architectural desserts. The one I'm going to make is an Edwardian classic using the much-loved pear, and it not only looks wonderful, but it tastes absolutely delicious. In the English spring, of course, the only pears available are from the southern hemisphere. The resourceful Edwardians were the first to address this problem, importing fruit from all over the empire. I'm poaching the pears in a mixture of white wine, sugar, water, with a few strips of orange zest. And while they're cooking, I'm making a custard, using egg yolks, sugar and milk. It's laced with a splash of kirsch, a favourite liqueur of the time. 
I want my custard to set fairly firm, so I'm adding a few leaves of pre-soaked gelatine. When that's completely dissolved, the custard is strained to remove any lumps. The cooled mixture is enriched with lightly whipped double cream, which is gently folded in. Next, half the mixture goes into a cake tin, where it's spread with a layer of amaretti biscuits. These were already a firm favourite with the well-travelled Edwardians, who would have sampled them on trips to the great Italian cities, Venice, Florence and Rome. They'll put a bit of crunch in the middle of this dessert, and they're covered with the remaining custard, which is put in the fridge to set. Edwardian cooks were both ambitious and experimental, and they were always coming up with little tricks for decorative touches. And they worked out that if you want to stick a few broken almonds on the back of a poached pear, a little bit of red currant jelly melted makes the perfect glue. A quick dip in hot water loosens the set custard from the mould and it's turned out straight onto the serving dish. It's quite sweet the way the little biscuits are peeping through, isn't it? The foundations are in place and now the real construction starts. A tower of thickly whipped cream is piped onto the centre of the custard where it plays a vital supporting role for my pillars of nut-crusted pear halves. A few slithers of candied angelica restore the lost stalks to the pears. And who could resist the crowning glory of a glacé cherry? Not me, I'm afraid. One of the Edwardians' favourite fruits was, strictly speaking, a vegetable, rhubarb. They couldn't get enough of the stuff. And up here in Yorkshire, vast tracts of land were cultivated to satisfy the desire for this astringent but aromatic flavour. This was the rhubarb capital of the world. But as with so many of their favourite crops, the Edwardians weren't content to let nature take its course. To improve on the outdoor varieties, they used a technique called forcing. Of the 200 farms that once made up the famous rhubarb triangle, only a dozen remain. One of them belongs to Janet Oldroyd, whose family have been forcing rhubarb for more than 70 years. Blunted for you. OK. Torch for me. Welcome right. to the rhubarb triangle. Wow, that is extraordinary. Do you know, I've never seen anything like this in my life. It's quite weird, isn't it? It's like a, it's like a sort of enchanted forest. And if we listen, we might hear it growing. I hear a sort of creaky crackling noise over there. Yeah, you can. That's the sound of rhubarb growing? Yep. Are you serious? Yeah. What is actually making that noise? Just as the rhubarb grows on up and it pushes past its neighbour, but also if we look down um, and I find a bud that's not burst here. Now, if you listen, this is what you would normally hear. It is, it is almost like a little pod. It's like a, it, it is. reminds me of Alien, actually. <laughs> Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> the pod pops and a curious creature emerges out. Yep, and this grows on up looking for the light, but of course it can never find it. So It's we rather are... tragic in a way, isn't it? There it is, searching so. for the light, and you're not giving it any. No, but this is where we get a more delicately flavoured, much more tender and sweeter product. The rhubarb plants spend two years outdoors, so they develop strong roots. Then they're lifted from the fields and brought inside the heated sheds. The warmth and absence of light tricks them into growing faster and stops them producing chlorophyll. The result is a sweeter taste and that luscious candy pink colour. Why do you think the Edwardians were so keen on rhubarb? It was immensely important to them that, that um, it was a fresh product. 
a vegetable that they used as a fruit that they were able to get fresh from the plant one day and on the table the next. Normally they would have been able to get apples, pears and things, but of course they were stored, so mm. it was immensely important to them. So from a seasonal point of view, in fact, uh, rhubarb was kicking in just at the time when all the stored apples and pears were finally turning a bit mealy. Yeah. So there's a lovely fresh thing arriving in sort of early March. Yeah. It tended to be the British that used it as a fruit. Um, it was used much earlier by the Syrians and Persians since the 13th century. We didn't start using it since, until the 18th century for cooking. But how far does your family go back? 1930s, we started into rhubarb. My great-grandfather came here, was a strawberry grower from Wisbeach, and in return for teaching a rhubarb grower how to grow strawberries, he was taught the secrets of the rhubarb triangle. So, Did you think of it as something very magical when you were a child? Oh, yes. Um, a fairyland for children. And in those days, the sheds were not heated by the propane burners that you see now. It was done... Uh, by coal from the arch coal fields, which meant flues which ran the whole length of the shed. This was a lovely game for children, sitting on their red-hot flues to see who could sit the longest. <laughs> what are the secrets? I can't tell you. One secret Janet has agreed to share with me is the recipe for a very special cocktail, the Pink Shocker is made from the syrup poured off from some stewed rhubarb, a little extra sugar, powdered ginger and vodka. That is lovely. Just have a go. Shaken, not stirred, it's a great favourite with her father, John, and husband, Neil. Cheers. 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 And our own cocktail sticks made to measure. That, that, How do you like that? That is outstanding, you know. Hey? It's lovely, lovely. That is really... It is one of the best cocktails I've ever had. Delicious. Now it's my turn to coin a cocktail in the Edwardian spirit. We know the Edwardians like champagne, and we know they love rhubarb. I don't know whether they ever put them together, but they should have done. So I have a feeling this one might just work. Let's have a go. It's a Yorkshire Bellini. Using rhubarb instead of the traditional peach should give it a seriously zesty tang. Try that one. Yep. Pink champagne. Yeah. Champagne. That's a nice little froth on it, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So here's to rhubarb. 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 Beautiful. That's pretty good too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I'd like to be forced to choose between them, actually. No. Quite happy to have the pair. Yeah. <laughs> In the Edwardian kitchen gardens of the grand houses, head gardeners love to experiment with new strains and varieties. And unlike so much of today's bland produce, the guiding principles of their selection were not colour, shape or shelf life, but what they ought to be. Sheer taste. Here at the National Trust site of Clumber Park in Nottinghamshire, head gardener Neil Porteous and his team are growing many varieties of vegetables lost to the mainstream market. This is blunt-rooted garandi. Oh, it's a pretty. real sort of wedge-shaped carrot. Yeah. And this was a popular variety in Edwardian times. They're very nice-looking carrots, these, but quite pale in colour, which I imagine in the modern market might make them harder to sell. But from a flavour point of view, that's not an anxiety necessarily, is it? No. I mean, the old-fashioned varieties are, are primarily bred for flavour, and the aesthetics of them, you know, whether they're all regular or, um, you know, they've got constant colour, just didn't come into it at all. It was all for the actual taste of them. So what have we got here, Neil? Well, we've got asparagus, an old-fashioned variety from 1870 called Conover's Colossal. Right. Uh, Size was everything. Absolutely. That's yeah, a try beaut. that to eat. What, to eat raw? Yeah. Just yeah. try it, see what you think. It's very good. It tastes like peas and beans at the same time. Mm. In the old days, the, the garden boys would have to whistle while they were pulling asparagus, because then you couldn't eat it, you know. 
to show that they weren't um, yeah. filching their master's <laughs> produce. Yeah. And what's happening under these pots? Well, we've got sea kale blanching. That is growing in the absence of light. And what that does, it makes it much less fibrous and chewy. And this was an Edwardian favourite, you know, to have this. There's a real luxury veg, this one. So the forcing takes all the bitterness out of it. Mm. It's a beautiful colour, very, mm. very pale. And this naturally would grow in shingle by the beach. Yeah, it? and it'd be tough as old boots. I mean, you'd never even consider eating it as a vegetable. There we are. And that's what we're eating. So you can eat all of that? Yep, in the leaves as well. Our last stop in the garden is the herb bed, where we're picking Chinese artichokes. They do a passable impression of giant maggots, but actually they're a member of the mint family. Our little collection of authentic period vegetable varieties is starting to look a lot like lunch. At Clumber Park, all the gardeners are encouraged to taste what they grow. In the improvised potting shed kitchen, I'm teaming up with Neil's colleague Tracy Akehurst, who likes to research old recipes for the traditional vegetables. She also likes to have someone else on hand to clean those fiddly little Chinese artichokes. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Stick some salt over the top of it, and then what you want to do is just gently rub the um, salt into them round, with a tea towel wrapped around them, and that just is, acts as a bit of an abrasive. So just sort of... Just give it a bit of a rub, and it just works its way in, and it just gives it a little bit of flavour as well. Because we're going to eat these raw too? You can eat them cooked, but we're going to eat them raw. We're going to make a, a, a vinaigrette dressing to go on top of it. It's actually a saffron vinaigrette. Yeah, and as you can see, the saffron has turned it this bright yellow colour as well. They taste very like a, a Jerusalem artichoke, um, but they've got this kind of crunch of a water chestnut to mm. them. So that makes them ideal for eating raw. But you can eat them very well. I mean, they're just lightly steamed. It doesn't take long to cook them. How many of these do you want? Is that enough to be going yes, on Yes, I think so. We can just pile them up on top of it, and then we'll pour the vinaigrette over the top. There you go. Right, OK. One final stir. Tracy's Edwardian saffron vinaigrette is the perfect dressing for our salad of Chinese artichokes, fresh-cut asparagus and old-fashioned lettuce varieties. Lovely. She also has plans for our sea kale. The flavour's a combination of asparagus and cauliflower. Mm. So how are you going to serve this delicious vegetable? Well, I'm actually going to um, serve it with a garlic cream sauce. Um, which has been used, not using garlic this time, but using um, rocamboli. It's a form of garlic, the difference being that these are actually aerial bulbils. Ah, these little things Absolutely. That look like sort of tiny daffodil bulbs. Well, they look like little garlic bulbs, don't they? They do. It was referred to as lady garlic because it supposedly has a milder flavour than a very strong, ordinary garlic. The lightly poached sea kale is arranged on little sippets of toast. The rocamboli and cream sauce is trickled over, and to complete this dainty little dish, a sprinkling of chopped chives. Altogether, quite a posh treat for the potting mm. shed. What Very delicate. Mm. What do you think about the rocamboli now that it's in the sauce? Really nice, mild actually. Mm. It's a very sophisticated dish, this. Neil, what would have happened in, in this room a hundred years ago? It's a very nice place to be yeah. eating it, but I don't suppose food like this was getting served up. Perhaps not as grand as this, but they'd certainly have lettuce and carrots and, you know, other staple crops. But this is where the gardeners had their meals. This is the bothy. They'd have a tea on the range. Um, and some of them, the unmarried men, would have slept in the room next door. Just that? Yeah. I can't wait to try these Chinese artichokes. Mm. See how they come out like. Mmm. Wonderful crunch. Mm. Mm. The Chinese and the Japanese actually liken them to um, pieces of jade when they pull them out of the ground. They think of them as being slightly pearlescent. Little so jewels. Think, yeah, little jewels. They call them little jewels. A little bit fiddly, but worth the fiddle, definitely, I think. Fruit and vegetables weren't just for the kitchen. They were also useful ingredients for popular homemade beauty treatments of the day. And a good lady's maid was always ready to make use of whatever was in season. Back at the house, my very own beautician, Caroline Rose, has brought me some delicious looking strawberries, but I have a feeling I may not get to eat them. Apparently, she wants to put them on my face. 
So the strawberries will be doing what exactly in the mask? Strawberries are very cleansing to the skin. Um, and the acid in them was said to impart a pleasing tinge to the skin. And what's the, that's peppermint, isn't it? It is. It's mainly for the fragrance, but it's also quite refreshing. Just Do you think my skin needs a lot of help, by the way? <laughs> no, I'm not saying it needs a lot of help. It's, um, it's a pampering treatment. It's something to uh, treat yourself with after a hard day. OK. Smell of summer. It is, isn't it? Summer is mm. here. The strawberries will arrive. Next, we need to break them down a little bit. This should be a rough puree, should it? Yeah. So that the juice is released. And this isn't just going to stain my face a strawberry won't. pink? It won't. No? No. There's a difference between a staining pink and a pleasing tinge. We're oh. going for the pleasing tinge. OK. The next ingredient was the oatmeal. It's particularly good for wrinkles, it was thought. Right. But we will find out. Not that you have many wrinkles. Laughter lines. Laughter lines. So you just have to use your instinct with this, really, and go with how it feels. OK, okay. a bit more have squishing and mushing. Have a squish. OK, if you could separate this egg, yeah. we're just going to use some of the white. Just the, the white. The yolk we don't need. The yolk you could use to wash your hair with later. Literally, raw Literally, egg yolk as it is. and nothing you else as a, a shampoo. You probably need two. I think I might need two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's a binding agent. That's going to stop it from separating and splitting. Right. And how long would this keep for? Only a couple of days, obviously. Fresh ingredients, the egg white in there, the strawberries. Happy with that? I think we're happy with that. Strawberry mud. I think we are, aren't we? We are. Keep it in the fridge, cool it down. So it should be a little bit a chilled thing. before we use it? Slightly chilled. It's just, it's nicer to use on the skin, I, I think. So my hand has already had a beauty treatment. Your hand should be in perfect condition. It feels cool and rather tingly, and all the better for being homemade. And while the strawberries get to work on my face, a couple of cucumber slices soothe my tired eyes. After the fruity facial, my pampered face looks almost as good as it feels. Curiously, the same ingredients play a vital role in a rather different recipe for pleasure. Pims, a gin-based drink that the Edwardians established as a great favourite of the summer season. The modern Pims has been debased with cheap lemonade stuffed with additives. To restore it to its former glory, place your strawberries, crushed mint and cucumber peel with some lemon slices in a jug. Add some caster sugar and plenty of fresh lemon juice, then pour in the Pims. Stir vigorously to dissolve the sugar, then add plenty of ice and top up with plain soda water. And that's going to taste as good as it sounds. It's one of the great long drinks of all time. And with one of these in my hand, and a brand new face to go with it, I feel ready to take on my guest at one of the most vicious games known to Edwardian society. Oh, unbelievable.